Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Cloud Saga Cinema Podcast. I'm your co-host Connor Van Sice, and today I'm joined by Ryan Danglar. Ryan, how's it going, man? That's all right. Not too bad. Not too bad. Hanging in there. How are you? I am fantastic. Um, Great. You know, just kind of living through life, still yeah. doing classes and all that work. And there you go. It's all you can do. Yeah. Today is going to be a little bit of a different format. Uh, we don't really have a movie that we're going to outright talk about. Uh, both Brian and I brought a movie of our choice, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. Um, neither of us know what movie we brought today. Exactly. Um, we've, but before we get into that, we're going to talk about the previews, which is aka our movie news and the happenings in the entertainment world. And we're going to start out with a bit of a connected piece of news uh we got the dune trailer a few days ago we did um but days later uh, i was announced by warner brothers that they're delaying wonder woman to december 25th meaning christmas day they would have two movies come out in the same week and mm-hmm. both of them are large budget movies so it's probably not going to happen yeah and i can almost guarantee that they're going to choose wonder woman over dune because Wonder Woman is a guaranteed money maker, while yeah. Dune is up in the air of how much money that's going to make. Exactly. So, but uh, Brian, what'd you think of the trailer? I loved it. I personally loved it. It's like a mix of every like sci-fi great that Denny Villeneuve's made, like with in terms of the feel and the look. Like it has that Blade Runner look. It has the Arrival look. Um, and I think it looks great. I think it's going to go for, if it comes out this year, hopefully, um, it's going to go for a bunch of Oscars. Cast looks great. You know, CG I don't know if great. it will get any uh, acting nominations, though. Pr- probably not, but it's definitely going to go for, you know, the cinematography score, special effects. Cinematography is great. Uh, Greg Frazier, I think, is the DP for it. And mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, he is doing uh, the Batman, I think. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's gonna Both have himself Warner Brothers movies. A two-year span of two, sure, two. great movies. But uh, yeah. I heard some complaints about the look of it. it was really like dark and bleak. But I guess so. I have a friend that's read the book, mm-hmm. and he was talking about how that's how the book describes the world. It's like dark, desolate. Yeah. So I mean, like. So I mean, if, if I they're matching, need to adapt a book because he hasn't like, yeah, not done a good job with an adaptation. So no, he hasn't done a bad job really with any movie. So I think if there's any guy who's going to do a great adaptation of a sci-fi like novel, it's going to be him. Of course, yeah, yeah. But um, I'll watch Wonder Woman. I guess I, yeah. I don't have a choice now. I got to wait another <laughs> year to see Dune. So. I got no choice but watch one on one, which I'm still yeah. looking forward to. Yeah, it's gonna be good. First one but was great three, so. for a three minute trailer. That was a very quick three minute trailer. Yes. So, uh, so speaking of delayed movies, we got news that Candyman is now delayed to 2020 or no? Is it indefinitely or 2021? It's either. I, th- I think it was 2021, a full year. I, you know what? I was so hyped for that movie because I love yeah. Yaya abdul Vantin. I like Nia DaCosta's uh, Little Woods. Um, again, people have to realize we are going to eventually see these movies. Yes. It's, yeah, it's not like they're never going to come out. So you just have to wait also, a little longer. We also have thousands of other movies from 100 years worth of stuff. So, mm-hmm. So I think... Everyone is fine. They can wait a little bit longer. Plus, this is this means that 2021 is going to be one of the most insane years of cinema oh, ever. Oh, for sure. You have a With, lot of mm-hmm. things coming in. So, I mean, as people wait, you know. Yeah. You also have to wait for Fast 9 going to space. That You know what? Great way to Michelle get to the next. Michelle Rodriguez came out <laughs> and said, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're going to space. So it was only a matter I, of time. I can't wait. If if it's true, it, because I believe she was asked if they were going to space at some point, and she said yes, and I believe she confirmed or confirmed that was going to happen in nine. If that's the case, I can't wait because you know, um, 
I love this franchise. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, I, I know you do. It's the it's one of those franchises where it's just you know what you're getting yourself after the fifth one, like fifth and on, you know what you're getting yourself into. And they're always insane. They're always just ridiculous. They always make no sense, but they're always just so much fun to watch. And it's one of those movies where or franchises, I should say, where you can just turn your brain off and have fun, and I love them for it. And so if they're going to space in a friggin' Dodge Charger, like rigged with rockets or something, go for it. I am all for it. No, I mean, I've barely watched any of them, so I don't necessarily... I'm not necessarily excited for it, but hmm. listen, I've been saying let's just go to space with it. Just ages, go to space. So just why not? Just just absolutely just send it. At, at this point Vin Diesel wh- turns into a planet. Yes, he turns he morphs into a planet. The rock turns into a planet. Everyone turns into planets. They just battle each other. It's like who can like Megazord this style. Can yes, exactly. That's <laughs> At this point, no one expects anything less from this franchise. Right, yep, yeah, right. They Let's took do down anything. a new nu- they Time took travel. down a yes, exactly. They took down a nuclear submarine in the last one with cars. Exactly. So I think they're fine if they win. They're gonna just try to one up each other. Every Absolutely. Time. The next two are like they're gonna earn so much money and they're oh, just for like sure. For sure. They're gonna they're throwing so much at the screen. Nobody cares anymore. The fans love it. I love it. They're, they're gonna be so ridiculous, but they're gonna be so great. But watch them turn like nine or ten into like Oscar exactly. caliber like drama yeah. performances. Like something like yeah. Drive. They just they just go they, all instead out. Of with somehow it. I don't know where they just turn into like really great movies. Yeah, like they, like three hour extravaganzas of just like well written like character arcs. Yeah, and exactly. Stuff. And it's just like they both win Best Picture. I would oh love God. it absolutely. I, you know what? Twenty twenty has been a crazy year, so I, I'm pretty sure that that wouldn't even be the craziest part. It would ab- no, it would not. It would it would fit right in. It yeah, would exactly. Fit right in. Um, do we want to get into uh, the New York Film Festival, which you just Absolutely. bought? You just bought a screener. I did. For, I've and, never yeah, done anything I like that so before. No, because so both Brian and I got um, virtual screeners for uh, Nomadland, which is Chloe Zhao's super hyped up film. Now I feel like it's picking up steam right at the right time mm-hmm. because right around this time last year, Parasite was starting to get that festival a lot of buzz a lot of buzz so Mm -hmm. i've heard francis is great i've heard um the cinematography is great the writing is fantastic it's up Mm -hmm. for a lot of categories already that's great i'm I'm i like that's so that's now probably one of my most anticipated movies for the rest of the year now that probably dune's gonna be Mm -hmm. leaving that list and french dispatch is probably i don't even know what's happening with that on the way out till like to next year yeah um yeah seeing how much this is sweeping and you mentioned before that I actually won the golden lion yeah which as is of crazy like, as of like three hours ago since we're recording this on a saturday it won the golden lion at the venice film festival which last year joker won that yeah so which is crazy so it's got a lot of steam going it has a lot of steam um, right now it's just picking up steam Mm-hmm. Other people are liking it. I think it has a 97 on Metacritic right now. Which yeah, and you, I think it also has like a 100. I think you said on Rotten Tomatoes as well. Yeah. Which Metacritic is, is a very – people don't realize how big of a deal Metacritic is because that mm-hmm. is directly from critics. Like that's mm-hmm. probably the most reliable source there of reviews. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably one of my most anticipated for the rest of the year, especially since Zhao is going to direct Eternals. Or already, I don't know how far along they are in the process of making yeah. that, but hey, I'm excited for that. Um, Absolutely. I don't know what other tickets you're going to get, if any. Um, I got I'll Ivory look through. official submission, The Kings of Night, mm-hmm. um, which was picked up by Neon, who actually oh, okay. was the same production company that had Parasite last year. Mm-hmm. So Ivory Coast could have a potential best foreign film on their hands. There we go. I um, I 
I also considered getting um, Stephen Queen's movie. Um, uh, his Ma- movies. Movies. Uh, yeah. Collection. And yeah. Um, John Boyega has a movie in there, which I didn't and even Letitia know. And Wright, too. Mm-hmm. So I thought about picking those up. And, you know, I might end up picking it up. Mm-hmm. Because Stephen Queen's awesome. I love his I, directing. Yeah, I 100% loved his last film, Widows. It's, I was one of my, like, it was like top two for me for 2018. So going off of that, I think. You're um, pretty excited for those. I'm pretty excited. So yeah. I'll, I'll probably check them out, but we'll see. And uh, I also got a ticket for Pedro and Moldovar's uh, short film, uh, the Human Voice, which stars Tilda Swinton. Okay. This is going to be followed by a and I don't know how that well that's going to go, but <laughs> I'm I'm pretty pumped for that because hey, hey, Pedro Pedro made a really good uh, film last year, Pain and Glory, and I need oh, to get oh that was him. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah. that. So <laughs> I'm pretty excited for that. Uh, I need to get more into his filmography, so this might be a good start. There you go. I might end up getting more films because it's Honestly. extremely cheap. Yeah, it's like like they range fifteen from like, to twenty five dollars. No, twelve to twenty five dollars. Something. Like, so. Yeah. So it's not much. So you yeah. could honestly get a whole bunch of them over a period of time. Yeah. Do we want to move into the main conversation? Let's do that. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, the, main, the 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 main feature here, the feature presentation. Brian, what movie did you bring to me today? So I brought a movie that has intrigued me for at least a year on my Netflix. And I've had it on there for a while. It's one of those movies where it doesn't have a trailer to play. All I knew about it was the synopsis and the poster that I had along with it. And that movie is 2013's Blue Ruin. Blue Ruin. Oh, wow. Blue, 2013's Blue Ruin. I knew nothing about this movie. I was so intrigued by it that I looked up nothing about it. I didn't look up So it was any, a blind watch. Completely blind watch. No trailers, no reviews. I All I knew was the synopsis went into it. And it's a weird one. It's kind of... so. Who is, it's an, who is in that? So let me check the cast real quick. I'll pull up the IMDb. It has, I'm going to butcher this. I'm going to butcher all these names. <laughs> Macon Blair, who plays this guy named Dwight. Yeah, oh boy. Yad- Yadavir Orizako, Ronald Sarkos, Danny Santiago. Is it a foreign film? It is not, actually, which is kind of crazy. And who, who directed it? The director was oh, I knew the name before Jeremy Saulnier you might know the name from 2015's Green Room same director really nice. yeah which I didn't know until looking up the all the stuff about this film afterwards um this film had I believe roughly a $420,000 budget and you wouldn't know that watching it. this movie looks at looks like it has like at least like a two million dollar budget it's a great looking film it's well acted. It's not long at all. Like it just hits feature length at an hour thirty. Um, cinematography was great. Uh, pacing was great. The only thing that I didn't like, I shouldn't say didn't like, but was a bit weird, was the writing. So, like I said, everything was good. The action. That was the main great. issue I had with Green Room too. Yeah, that that was like the writing. The, like I almost didn't like connect with the characters and the writing is very. It can be odd at times. It's not bad, but so this movie wants wants to take a more realistic approach. So it's a revenge thriller. I won't like. If, actually, I'll read off the synopsis for you real quick. Um, it's a revenge thriller. Uh, let's see. A mysterious outsider's quiet life is turned upside down when he returns to his childhood home to carry out an act of vengeance. Proving himself an amateur assassin, he winds up in a brutal fight to protect his estranged family. Basically, um, another like synopsis that i could come up with is this homeless guy um after a year like i think it was like years after his mom and dad were killed by this one guy the guy gets released from prison and he sits out on this like revenge like like mission basically to kill him and what follows is like spurts of these like gruesome violence it's very like 
it's not a movie where something happens and it turns like a shaky cam to try and like work around the action. No, when it like something goes down, it you see it right there. Um, it's brutal. It's realistic, but um, the writing, that's what I'm going to get into is the writing. It's, it, it takes a more realistic approach with the, the plot and character decisions. So there's sometimes where it doesn't feel cinematic. It feels realistic, but in a weird way where it's kind of like the plot's going, it's going, it's going, and then character dialogue will happen. And then they'll reveal like two or three things right there that they didn't even talk about before, but they it like make sense kind of. Um, and then the plot will go, 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 and there'll be more dialogue and then it'll happen again. And this happens maybe like three times throughout the film. And it's a bit weird how it goes about it. It doesn't stop the pacing at all. Like the pacing is always like pretty like fluid. It's an easy watch. You could just throw it on and it'll come and go like that. Um, but the just that writing and the dialogue at times too, where characters will it's it's such a it's a weird thing to explain because I, I there's a scene later on in the film that i won't I won't really talk much about as because it's kind of a spoiler um if you would if you wanted to check it out at some point um where it's kind of like an interrogation kind of scene. And it's like a clash of styles between two characters. And it Does it almost get mixed up in itself? Kind of, kind of, sort of. Where I, feel like like, I, I feel like we're talking about Green Room right here. Because I feel like Green Room is very guilty of similar things to where it gets lost in what it wants to be. Absolutely. And I wouldn't say necessarily gets lost. I think it's a more, it's a cleaner movie than Green Room, which is kind of funny, considering that this movie came out before Green Room. Um, I personally like this one more than Green Room. Um, This one wasn't like as like ridiculous and like silly as Green Room. Um, The way it goes about things is a little better, but it's just that writing is just like, that writing is keeping it from an outstanding score because I liked mm-hmm. everything else about it. And um, considering that I had ne- heard nothing about this beforehand is a bit surprising. Um, I looked up, after I was done with watching the movie, I looked up stuff afterwards. And I guess it kind of like made its way through like really small film festivals and never hit anything like Canis. That never sense. That, never had, such ne- a low budget, that definitely seems like one that yeah. would just make one of the smaller festival circuits mm-hmm. kind of that's probably how he got green room picked up by someone like mm-hmm. a24 a24 uh, yeah they, exactly they probably saw his original ideas for it and then they probably saw his and film so exactly and the the production companies i had never heard of so i'll pull those up right now because in the opening credits it was just like stuff you would see in like you probably have heard of them, but it's like it's like production companies you would see in like a dollar bin at oh, like really? Walmart. Yeah, so it was distributed by, let's see here. Oh, this is a branch of the Weinstein Company. Um, Radius. It was distributed by Radius. And... I think oh, I've it heard did? of it before. Okay. Um, its budget was only 420000 but it made back almost a million. So that's it did. Hey, that's probably what got him on the map. Is that Honestly. Probably, I mean, a million doesn't seem like a whole lot when you go based off of something like Tenant or, yeah. you know, a Marvel movie. But, hey, a million dollars for an indie kind of, like, smaller budget movie, that's pretty impressive. Well, of course. And I guess so it did premiere at Cannes, but it went under the director's Fortnite section, which... I don't con not, con is really weird about that. Yeah. Um and I guess he funded the film through a successful Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, Kickstarter and, that that like Kickstarter it probably went through the phase of the Kickstarter where films were being picked up that way. 
mm-hmm. and found that way. I and, mean, it still happens to this day, but there was yeah. a, there was that boom, like a period of time where all these films were getting picked up, yeah, and funded. And considering that you got four hundred twenty thousand, that's pretty impressive. That. That, People must have crazy. been impressed by the idea that he had. So yeah, and it wasn't like. It wasn't based on a book or anything. It was a completely original idea. It was an original screenplay. I think he wrote it too, I believe. He did. So it was written and directed by him, all by himself. So good on him. Good on him. Um, yeah, all in all, so I, I liked it. I was, it was enjoyable, like I mentioned before. And I, my score has switched twice now, where at first, right as the credits were rolling, I was left at a 7.5. I was like, that was, it was enjoyable. It was fun. It had some weird moments, but like overall, I'd probably give it a 7.5. And then I thought more on it. And I'm like, a 7.5 felt too high at that moment. So then I dropped it down to a seven and then I slept on it. I woke up today and I was thinking more about it. And it's not a movie that's going to make you think, but I was just thinking about all these different elements that went into it. And I thought more about it. And I'm like, well, there's certain things that like the things that I didn't like kind of made sense with, in terms of the plot, like the realism Mm -hmm. where it doesn't quite feel that cinematic and it feels more like you're actually watching something unfold in front of you rather than through a screen. And I think for that, aside from the writing, because the writing's keeping this one down still from hitting a nine. I would honestly finish this at like an eight. I think this is going to get an eight. It's higher than what I would give Green Room. Green Room, I would give like a seven, 7.5. But this one, um, I like. it's an interesting revenge thriller. It goes, it takes a different route because usually I watch a reviewer and he said that most revenge movies are like a parent they, yeah, they someone. follow the same kind of formula every time. So Yeah, and this one, like where it's like a, the guy's going after someone who killed his kid or his wife or something, but this time it's the kid or a kid, he's like 20-something in this movie, going after someone who killed his parents. And that's something you really don't see that often. I don't think I've ever seen that on screen before. Um, I mean, if you're, if, if you're going to compare a character to that, it'd probably be Batman. Honestly, you know what? It probably would be Batman. Um, but yeah, all in all, it was enjoyable. It was something that's been on my list on Netflix for a while. And then I finally decided to check it out. I knew nice, nothing man. about it. Go- yeah. I might have to check it out now. It seems yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I don't. It's one of those movies where I don't. It's so small and so hidden. I don't ever see it getting pulled. It's mm-hmm. going to be one of those movies where like, it's going to stay on there for a while and Netflix is just going to forget that it's on there. It's going to be like a cult classic or something like that. Yeah. Like, honestly, like if it stays on there long enough and people keep watching it, it could turn into that. Honestly. Um, yeah. Eight out of 10 for blue ruin. Nice. Connor, what was the film you chose? All right. So I went with something that came out this year. Um, okay. it is Charlie Kaufman's I'm thinking of ending. Mm. Which okay. I watched two times back to back. Okay. Much. Okay. Okay. So Charlie Kaufman is probably one of the best writers working today. I mean, oh, absolutely. No one beats Sorkin. I feel like. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if you have, he's written Eternal Sunshine and Spotless Mind, being John Malkovich. Uh, this he wrote adaptation and Amalisa. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's gonna. Uh, Synecdoche, New York. Synecdoche, New York, or yeah. whatever. Um, this is probably his less accessible film yet, which is kind of hard okay. to believe because he's made like everything else he's been a part of. Yeah, is in like insane to think about. Um, mm-hmm. But this follows Jesse Buckley and Jesse Plemons on a trip to. Um, Jesse Plemons' parents' house, who are played by Tony Collette and Daniel Thewlis. Mm-hmm. And it's that's really all I can say about the plot <laughs> because I couldn't tell you a whole lot. Um, upon first viewing, upon first viewing, I don't think a lot of people understood it. Um, very few probably did, uh, myself included. 
Um, but upon rewatch, this is probably the scariest film this year. Mm. Not okay in a traditional horror sense. Yeah. Um, Charlie Kaufman, someone hurt him as a child, I feel like, <laughs> because he's in down he's down in the dumps. Because this one, it's almost like the message that you get at the end of the film is the scariest part of life is being alive. If that makes sense. Hmm. I, I guess so. I guess because, so. Because like it goes into depth about life and how time doesn't like life doesn't stop for you <laughs> because as soon as you want to change something about yourself or like change something that you do within your life life is already three steps ahead of you so you kind of have to catch up and it really doesn't stop and like it's almost like when you when you die you get your moment you know but Mm -hmm. life kind of just moves on without you like it doesn't even care you're kind of just this speck of dust on a table that's dusty or something like that that's probably a really (laughs) shitty uh, analogy but i tried the first time to find a meaning out of it and i thought i had one with relationships and how you know um during relationships you talk about your future that Mm -hmm. may probably never happen you know you dream about a future that you may never have and you talk about your past which your other partner doesn't know if it's true or not um and i feel like it's kind of it's definitely not that it's more of a person this is it's insane to dissect it really is because i use the the theme of you know being alive is the scariest thing because you you know you don't you don't know how your life is going to play out you know mm-hmm. you you're born and then you die. That's your timeline, pretty much. And there are little dashes in between, but those events really don't matter at the end of the day. And it kind of discovers that, be, it, well, not discovers that, but like goes over that idea and how, you know, your achievements may not reflect in the long run and how you can have a dream of something that you want to be in life, but you're going to wake up one day and you're 80 years old living in a retirement home on your deathbed. So there's so much to dissect here. Um, and I'm not even going to try to attempt it because I'll be here for three hours. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to make anyone more depressed than they probably are <laughs> listening to this, but uh, I will say the positives are of course the performances by everyone. Mm-hmm. Um Jesse Buckley needs to be in more movies. Um, she is fantastic. She was brilliant in Chernobyl and um, I think Wild Rose she was in last year. But she has her moments to shine. Her uh, long epilogues are fantastically written. Um, Jesse Plemons is probably one of the most underrated actors working today. Absolutely. Honestly, his stuff in Breaking Bad mm-hmm. and everything, like everything he's been in, it's fantastic. I want to see him in more movies. Tony Collette, probably, it, it, she's very funny and creepy at the same time. Her introduction mm-hmm. is probably some of the best stuff the movie has to offer. Um, Daniel, uh, David Thewis is in it less than anyone, I'd say, out of the four. But I think when he's in the movie, he has the most sentimental parts where he gives you, there's a scene when him and Jesse Buckley are in a room and there's a line dialogue and I won't say it because it's, it caught me off guard because when I thought about it, I'm like, well, it's probably going to be me in 34 (laughs) years looking back. Um, It's a really sad movie but it's also a very real movie. Like it's very grounded. 
There's a lot of metaphors in it. Um, Charlie Kaufman, man. It's a shame that this movie is probably too weird for the Academy to nominate it for anything. Mm -hmm. Because it does take... Listen, I probably need to view this at least two or three more times. And even then, I probably won't get the full thing. Because there's... The last 30, 40 minutes is probably some of the hardest film I've ever had to try to dissect. Really? Like, and it's based off a book. So maybe I need to read the book to understand it better. But it, it is something really special. And it, that's hard, hard to think after everything else that Charlie Kaufman has done. Yeah. But, um, the score that they utilize, which I don't think is an original score, is beautiful. It is so pretty to look at if i were to give this um a nomination for anything give it cinematography there are some really great shots in this film really great um there's a lot of if i were to complain about anything like 90 percent of this movie is in a car and there are times where the Hmm. dialogue is so complex and there are times where there's talk like they're referencing paintings and movies and stories and it's so hard to follow at times which Mm -hmm. if i if i knew more about art or books and stuff like that i would probably be able to follow it better yeah but i felt like those scenes went on for a little too long but at the same time i felt like some of the most powerful um scenes just because of the performances which are great um yeah as of right now, it's a four out of five. Okay. Um, it will probably raise up to a four and a half. Um, Upon like another watch yeah. or thinking this more about it. This is something I feel like is going to become a cult classic along with every other thing that Kaufman has done. Mm-hmm. It is like I want to dissect it and I feel like we could have <laughs> done a whole entire like four hour live stream trying to do it. Um, yeah. I would highly recommend it though because it is very strange, but it's very surreal because no other film, I don't think this year, especially maybe even last year made me stop and think about everything in life, like everything. I just had to like reset my brain to think in that sense because it's so grounded and you feel the emotion that, every emotion, every gut punch that the film tries to go for. Um, so. Yeah, when something is weird, but also like that grounded, I it feel is, like it is. hits more. Yeah. Because it's, it, it is a dream movie. But it's mm-hmm. basically, it's one big dream. It, okay. well, it's not one big dream, but it feels like a dream. Oh, uh, gotcha. Okay. The way it's shot, the way it's acted, the way it feels like this atmosphere within the movie is just something I've never felt before. Okay. So okay. it's honestly, it might overtake Tenant, my favorite. Really? Movie. Um, the more I think about it, even talking about it right now, the, I, I haven't thought about a film this much in a very long time. So I really liked it. That's crazy. It's not for everyone, though. No, I I, guarantee you, whoever's watching this, 90% of you <laughs> probably won't like it because you don't get it. And that's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. But it's... Yeah, the movies that aren't like that straightforward like are so hit or miss yeah. with most audiences. But this, I think, succeeds in everything that it goes wrong. Okay. So, four out of five for me. Probably four and a half to come at some point. Mm-hmm. Upon two or three more rewatches. Listen, I gotta watch it at least two or three more times before the year's done, because that's gonna overtake ten, and I can already tell. So, was this one Kaufman directed or is just written? Yes, Kaufman directed uh, and written. Directed. Uh, oh, okay, okay. So, I can't wait to see what else he does because I love uh, Anomalisa. Mm-hmm. Um, I love being John Malkovich. I love Eternal Sunshine. That movie's fantastic. Mm-hmm. so i can't wait to see what else he does i just want him to write more he wrote a book that actually or a novel that came out this year Ain't really i really want to pick it up okay so, yeah man highly recommend it it's not i do want to check it out mm-hmm. it's really good 
I do want to check it out. I think it's the most added or the most recently added thing I have on my list on Netflix. So yeah, I definitely want to check it out at some point. Definitely requires um, multiple watches. Mm-hmm. Do not stop at one. Okay. Do not stop at one. Because <laughs> you will be pissed off because the film <laughs> really doesn't give you everything. Gotcha. It it leaves almost nothing answered. So Jesus. And that's what Kaufman uh, does. So, <laughs> so uh, that's been uh you know, the feature presentation. A bit different this week. Uh, both mm-hmm. our films that we've uh picked. Uh, we're gonna get into the end credits where we talk about uh what we've been watching, um, any recommendations or anything. Um actually I haven't been able to watch a whole lot. Okay. Um That's all right. I've been binging Twin Peaks. Mm. David Lynch's uh show there on Netflix, okay. Okay. which I had to scour the entire tri state area to try to find the third season of on DVD because I'm not paying extra for Showtime. So I was able to catch that. Uh, I'm halfway through season two. And huh. I won't lie, it is some of the best television I've ever seen. It is really? probably the only thing of David Lynch's that I fully like <laughs> and that I can somewhat get. Somewhat get. Yeah. Okay. It is a crime mystery, you know, David Lynch show. So it's, yeah, still, sure. weird. it's still weird. Still really weird, but more. All, all I'll say is there's a lady with a log, and the log talks to people, and she talks to the log, and that's all I have to say. That's David Lynch. That, that's David Lynch right there. That's David Lynch. I can Lynch. get into the other David Lynch stuff, but that's the most David Lynch stuff that I could pick out. I love later. it. I love it. But honestly, some of my favorite TV um, ever. Uh, I did not expect myself to get this attached to the show. And I consistently okay. think about it, and it's great. <laughs> Kyle McLaughlin is fantastic in it. Um, really interesting, and I was just engaged from the get go. Like, it, it's something about the feeling of the show that I mm-hmm. love. So, highly recommend it if you get if you want to get into another show. And so, I've been really watching. So, gotcha. I, I have been. Also watching a TV show. I just finished up season two. Yesterday, I finished up season two of Better Call Saul. Yes. Nice. Um, oh, my. oh, there we go. Um, and I'm enjoying it. I really am. The first season was like hit or miss with me. I watched, and then I finished, I watched, I think, four episodes yesterday. I watched two before Blue Ruin. And then I watched two after Blue Ruin, and uh, it leaves, it's it, it's it's uh, Gilligan, it's Vince Gilligan. So the season ends. It is so the good. The first season didn't end like it, but the second season, it's very, it's very good right now, and it does. It's very good. um, so but I'm enjoying it. I it's really starting to pick up steam. Yeah. It is so like as and soon as the late seasons come watch. around, oh my god, mm-hmm. it's some of the best TV out there. I know, I know I just said I, about Twin Peaks, but Dark mm-hmm. Saul and Breaking Bad are some of the best television out there. We could have an entire uh, episode of just how good TV is. So. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, my internet's acting up. Right no, now, it's so fine. I'll put a um, link in the description. Um. But yeah, uh, Better Call Saul, I've been watching. Um, I've been watching football. Football's back. Football is back. College I caught, and NFL. College I and NFL. Game the other night, so. uh, I caught tomorrow. most of it. I caught, like, the first three quarters. Um, it was a, you know what, solid game. Um, you could definitely tell people are rusty because of no preseason. But oh, for sure. I can only imagine what tomorrow's going to be like. Tomorrow's going to be – you're probably going to see I, a lot of questions from a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. So. Um, my Cowboys play Sunday night in the Rams' brand spanking new stadium, SoFi Stadium, and I'm nervous. Hey, <laughs> man, I, my Patriots are playing tomorrow. First time without <laughs> Brady in like 20 years. So who are they? Who who are they against? 
I oh Miami, I think maybe. No idea. <laughs> I think maybe. Listen, I haven't followed football since the uh, end of last season. So. Um. But yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be such an interesting season. I I can't wait. I needed it's be this. Interesting, to say the least, with no fans, probably for the whole season. Mm-hmm. Or limited fans, as in Kansas City. Yeah, because Arrowhead had, I think, 13,000 fans in it on Thursday. I don't know why you would risk it, but hey. I'm not in charge of No that. idea. I'm not in charge uh, of that. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I hope I can – as soon as Twin Peaks is done, uh, I'm going to shove my face with a lot of movies, so – All right, I think Brian's audio keeps cutting in and out in his internet. So I'm cutting in and out really bad. No, it's all good. Um, Uh, You you are frozen for me. Are you? All right, am I? All right, well, listen, we got in all the things that we needed to talk about this week. Um, Before both of our internets cut out, it's been a pleasure, uh, Brian. Um, I don't know what we're going to be doing next week. This was a bit of a shorter podcast. Um, mm-hmm. Stay tuned. Our schedules are a bit weird lately, so our posting schedule is a bit off lately. Um, but, yeah, uh, this has been Connor Van Slice of the Cloud Saga Cinema Podcast. Jesus. Brian, I, if, you're, if your internet cuts out again – Brian, can you hear me? All right, never mind then. Uh, Hold on. All right, all right guys. Uh, we'll catch you in the next I- one. All right, I'm Brian Dangler. Bye. <laughs>